This podcast is brought to you by the Association for Coaching, an international professional body which is advancing coaching in business and society. I am Silva Newton, a coach who is passionate about supporting teams and people to grow, and I'm your host for the AC DAR podcast. In this new podcast, designed by the German, Swiss, and Austrian chapter of the Association for Coaching and offered worldwide, I talk to coaches, academic, and experts who share their passion for this incredible profession. We will dive deep into one specific aspect of their work. Our ambition is to contribute to the development of the coaching profession at large, and more specifically, to bring you some new ideas and insights that you can start implementing right away. Jeff, hello. Nice to have you on uh, our podcast today. Thanks for taking the time to be with us. Well, thanks very much, Sylvan. It's great to be here and uh, excited to be part of the first ever AC Duck Region podcast. Yes, you are our first guest and I'm very excited about that. Maybe, Jeff, you want to introduce yourself to our uh, listener today who might not know you. Okay, well, from an AC perspective, I've been a member of the association for a number of years now. And in fact, last year I was honored to be invited to be the first chair of the Dach region, so that's Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Uh, so I'm very involved with the AC like that. But from a professional background, I actually work as a strategic HR consultant. I'm an accredited coach. Uh, and my focus is very much on working with organizations and with people on how they can fulfill their potential. So I've worked for a number of different Uh, organizations in the past. I worked for HP, for Roche, for Nestle. Um, so I think I've seen in many cases what great looks like. And now what I'm interested in is helping to work with people and organizations to see what I can do to go and help them. And just as a bit of background, although I'm British by background, as you can tell from my accent, I've actually been living in Geneva since the early 1990s. So I'm actually Swiss as well. So that's where the, uh, the duck part fits in. That's great. So you have an international experience. You said, Jeff, that you are a coach. So one thing I would love to hear is why did you join the, the profession of coaching? Well, that's a good question. I mean, really it's something that grew out of my experience as a line manager. And I found that during my professional career, I always found the part around helping and developing people was one of the most rewarding parts of the job. So I was actually interested in how I could continue to build my coaching skills as a people manager. And once I started to work independently, I wanted to build on that. So now my focus is very much on performance coaching, career coaching, and really helping people to be more fulfilled in their work and also helping them to navigate career changes successfully. Yeah, that's a very noble uh, goal you have, Jeff. Um, so what is the most exciting and what is the scariest about being a, a coach? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think the most exciting bit is when you feel there's a really strong rapport with your coachee and you can literally sense the energy in the session. That's the bit which I really enjoy. And you, you know, it's great when you can help clients really reach important insights and when you can feel that they're fired up to move forward and they can really begin to work on some of the concerns that brought to the session. That to me is what coaching is really exciting and something which I really enjoy. I think scariest, well, I think the scariest bit is probably for coaches when they begin because at the start is a little bit like driving. You know, you, you've got so many things to think of that can be a bit overwhelming. And I think in the early stages of coaching, There was a bit of that where you'd think about, well, where's the session going to go? And have I got all the tools ready in my toolkit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and actually, the experience has shown that it's by letting go and allowing the session to go where it needs to go, giving the client space, that that's really where you get some interesting insights. So that's the bit where it's about overcoming that fear factor and, and letting go. I like that, Jeff, because it's true that being able to slow down and really focus on the coachy enable you to be at your best in that coaching discussion. So to take your analogy of driving, when you stop thinking about all the things you have to do at the same time, you can enjoy the scenery and, and maybe go off-road from time to time and be surprised by what you discover. 
Exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> so let's go into your research, Jeff, because you've been, you didn't say that, but on the top of being a consultant and being a coach, you are an author as well. And so you've been doing research, you've been writing about uh, employee engagement. So what I would like to know is, is if you could tell us more about it. How did you do the research? What kind of things you, you found out? Well, yeah, I mean, employee engagement is really something which is a great passion of mine. Uh, I've done a lot of work within organizations in the past on working on the subject of employee engagement. And what I've seen is that when it's addressed in the right way, it can make such a big difference, both in terms of how people feel and how the organization performs. And so I was really interested in how we could spread the word on the potential that it had. And it's you know it's over 30 years now since William Kahn, who first came up with this idea of personal engagement, um, wrote a paper on this topic, it's a research paper. And since then, there's been a lot written about employee engagement, but a lot of it is directed at human resources. So there's actually relatively little which is aimed at line managers, even though they're the ones who play such an important role in creating an environment that allows people to be fulfilled. And so my concern was that you know, in many cases, line managers may not know about employee engagement, or if they do, they're not sure what they can do about it. And, yeah. and they don't necessarily see the business benefits of that. And so for that reason, you know, I teamed up with Linda Holbeach, who's a well-known academic, and we wrote this book together, which was called Engaged. Uh, and that was designed to inform, inspire, and empower managers. And I'm pleased to say that it actually got shortlisted for the CMI Management Book of the Year Award, and uh, Klaus Schwab, who's the founder of the World Economic Forum, actually described it as being essential reading for all business leaders. So uh, it really is aimed to you know, touch the hearts of managers and leaders and help them to think about what can they do to address this area much more effectively. That's great. Now, you use the word engagement, Jeff, and it's yeah. a word that's being used in, in almost every article I read those days. Uh, so how do you define that? What is engagement? Maybe how does it differ from motivation, satisfaction, loyalty? There are lots of other terms out there. So what is what is your definition of engagement? That's an important point because I think people do tend to get these things muddled up and there are some important differences. I mean, motivation is very much about to what extent have you got that desire or willingness to make an effort. So it depends a lot on what are you going to get as a, re as a reward, a return for what you're doing. It's also very much about how likely you're going to receive that reward and also whether you value the reward in the first place. You, know, you might, for example, be offered, if you do X, I'll give you a box of chocolates. Well, if you're on a diet, then actually being given a box of chocolates isn't very valuable to you anyway. So it doesn't have a motivational effect. But motivation is very much about that kind of stick and carrot element. And that's quite different from engagement because engagement is really characterized by people putting in extra work without being asked. It's not about dangling something in front of them to make it happen. Rather, it's about people having a strong sense of belonging, have a strong sense of attention to what they're, uh, they're doing. And so they want to do it anyway. So it's quite different from motivation. And similarly, satisfaction, people often get confused between satisfaction and engagement. They're, they're also quite different because satisfaction is very much about self-gratification. You know, I, I can, you know, you know, your boss could double your salary while you feel very satisfied but you wouldn't necessarily feel engaged, more engaged as a result of that. Because at the end of the day, you can feel fine about the job, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go the extra mile or do something which makes a difference. And engagement is much more about enthusiasm, excitement, and really a sense of intensity about the job. So that, that's the difference. And you know, when William Kahn proposed this concept originally, what he noticed was engaged employees were, as he put it, they fully inhabit their roles, not just do their jobs. And I think that's a big difference. It's almost sound like a calling. It's not a job, it's a calling. Maybe something that you could find in people working in uh, uh, charities or a non-governmental organization. It sounds like there is something bigger that makes me go the extra miles and not specifically the, the small reward I might get at the end. Exactly. I mean, I think it's no surprise that actually you see 
particularly highly engaged people working in things like uh, charities and things like things like this, because they do have that sense of vocation. So engagement does have a lot of overlap with that, but it can happen in all environments. And you know, and I think one of the interesting things about engagement is that when Linda and I did the research for the book, what we found was that in fact a lot of the things which managers can do are either low cost or no cost to actually engage people. And a lot of the time managers think, oh well, what I need to do is I've got to offer an additional bonus or I've got to go and do this or do that. And actually some of these things are really quite simple to do. They're not that difficult. But it's just about spending the time to create that kind of engaging environment for people. I'm hearing a distinction, Jeff, in what you are saying. And I don't know if it's what it's meant to be, so help me out. But it sounds when you talk about uh, satisfaction, for example, or motivation, I heard uh, in your example that the reward was material. And obviously, you, you use the, the box of chocolate. It could be an increase of salary. It could be a few days off. It could be a big role, something tangible. While when we started to talk about William Kahn's definition, it sounded more something intangible. It's a calling, mm. and, and my reward is maybe a sense of satisfaction, a sense of completion. Might be I'm able to show compassion to somebody. It seems more intangible, what I get. Mm. Is, is, that, mm. is that important or...? Yes, I think so. Yes. I mean, there is that sort of intangible piece and it's, it's something which is not going to be suddenly swayed by, you know, what you dangle in front of people. There is something more intrinsic about it. So there is a, a certain connection between engagement and intrinsic motivation. But, you know, if you, if you look at how people measure and, and look at engagement, it's often about, you know, to what extent do they see people ready to go the extra mile? To what extent do they speak with pride about the place where they go and work? It's, it's those kinds of things. It's that kind of strong emotional connection that people feel with both the job and the organization, which I think characterizes engagement. Yeah, that sounds great. So if I remember from your research, Jeff, you found out that there were um, four drivers of employee engagement. Could you talk about those four drivers? Sure. I mean, before we jump into the four drivers, actually, it's maybe useful just to talk about a couple of preconditions for engagement, because I think particularly in the current working environment, those are terribly critical. The first thing is that we said that before people can even be engaged, they've got to, managers got to think about to what extent do trust and fairness exist in their organizations? Trust, because at the end of the day, if you have trust in a place, you feel that if you know things are going to happen which are predictable, you know that if you do something, you get something back in return which is expected. So there's, there's that kind of uh, reasonable understanding and predictability about the working relationship. The second point, which is about fairness, is that also that when you are treated in a particular way, it's consistent with other people. It's not that there's favoritism or that people are sort of picking and choosing who gets uh, treated in a certain way. But you, you again, you know that uh, what happens to you is going to be reasonable compared with your colleagues. So trust and fairness are kind of preconditions. They're almost like the tickets to the game. If you don't have those, people are not going to be open to be engaged because they're going to say, why would I bother? Because I don't know what the outcome is going to be. You know, or or the outcome is going to be potentially adverse or not completely equitable. So for those reasons, trust and fairness are, are important as a kind of a precursor for anybody wanting to be engaged. But if if those things are being met to a reasonable degree in an organization, and we know that in some places that's not the case, but if they're being reasonably met, then the four drivers we saw in organizations were really these. First of all, what we call connection, then secondly, support, then thirdly, voice, and finally, scope. So maybe I can unpack those a bit more and tell you. Yes, please. Yeah. Are. So connection is very much about how far do you identify where you're working? How far do you feel pride? Do you have a sense of common purpose? Do you have shared values? I mean, it can be the same feeling as you have when you belong to an organization, not just work, but if, for example, you belong to a sports team or a club or an association or a religious organization, there's things where you have a kind of a common language. You know that you're all trying to achieve the same sort of things. 
um, you, you're pleased to be part of that and to be connected with those people. So that sense of sort of connection is important. And that can matter a lot in organizations if people feel like, I don't share the values of what the organization is doing. And you see that particularly with a lot of people saying, is my employer, for example, concerned about uh, environmental or social goals? But also it's important in the sense of, uh, do they feel like the the culture and the, the values of the organization are ones which they share in? So that sense of connection is very important. And if people feel that sense of connection, then they're more likely to feel engaged and, and do more. The second one, support, is very much about to what extent you feel like you're being treated as an individual. You know, is, does your boss really know you as a person? Uh, do you feel valued? Are you empowered to do the job? And are they concerned about your well-being or are you just sort of treated like a number and you're just expected to go on with things and nobody's really too bothered about what happens to you? So support is is an important one. Uh, and then the third one is voice, which is really to what extent you have a say in the place where you work. So are you asked for your opinion? Do you get involved in decisions? Do you even know what's going on? But voice is important. I think particularly when you look at people entering the workplace today, who are often the most educated generation ever, uh, you know, you're bringing smart people into the organization. If they're left in the dark and they can't use their talents in the decisions which take place, then the danger is they're going to feel, again, quite disengaged as they feel like there's a, you know, I'm not really being involved here. And then the last one is about scope. And scope is really about to what extent do I have a clear role in what I do? Uh, do I have a sense of autonomy? Or is there a risk that you know, people are kind of getting into turf battles with me? It's unclear what my job is. In addition to that, is there a sense that I can get a sense of accomplishment in what I do? And can I grow and develop in my role? Or have I kind of been left to, to stagnate? And do I find meaning in the things which I actually do? And again, that's very important because people come into a role, they don't just come in to do a particular job. Often they want to see that they can expand, develop, grow, and they can get that sense of purpose out of the work they do and feel they're making a bigger difference. So again, that sense of scope is important. So those four things, connection, support, voice, and scope, are really what we found were some of the most key preconditions for helping to create an engaged workplace. That's super interesting, Jeff. The, a lot of things that you mentioned um, are really what people are looking for. Can I develop? Can I learn? Can I grow? Do I belong to that place, the sense of belonging? Am I valued for what I can bring? Are my strengths recognized, my, my way of being? So a lot of elements are, are in your model. When you say connection, support, voice, and scope, do you feel that companies now, uh, with your international experience, and maybe we are generalizing here, but do you feel companies are typically better at some and struggle more with other of those four? I don't know. I think it varies a lot from place to place. There are different, but depending on the organization, its history, its culture, uh, they may be better or worse than others. So uh, I think it's hard to go and say, no, there's one which is particularly uh, a major factor. What I would say is there's probably three things which are happening where managers are struggling. Uh, the first one is I think that taking any of those different drivers of engagement, I think one of the problems is that a lot of line managers have a lack of time. And so they tend to sort of be focused on the urgent and they put all of these sort of more human aspects of, the, of their role on the back burner. So that's one of the challenges. Uh, the second thing is that a lot of those things which – you know, you just play back so on. They're very much about empowering and enabling people and involving them. But that actually means that the managers need to let go a bit. They need to reduce that social distance. They have, they have to share some of their power. And that, again, can be a challenge sometimes for managers because they may feel uncomfortable about that and they may sort of be reluctant to go and do that. And then the third thing, which is crucial, and I think this is particularly relevant in the coaching context, is to what extent are they able to put themselves in the shoes of their people? Because there's a danger sometimes that managers may think, well, it's one size fits all. If I do X, that will work for everyone. And actually, what we know is that we're all unique. 
and that the particular drivers and things which fire us up at work can be quite different. So it's really about understanding what those things are. So are you spending the time to understand what really gets somebody jazzed in their work? What is it they might be looking for for the future? Where they see themselves longer term, etc. And it's being able to have those conversations as well, which really help. So those, I think, are some of the things which often get in the way of all of those different drivers. It's, it's really that kind of lack of time, inability to let go, and sometimes not being ready to put themselves in somebody else's shoes. It's helpful you mentioned Jeff, that, Jeff, because it's true that engagement is very well researched. And the model you gave us today is almost a model that any leader, any company could use to work on systematically improving their level of engagement. And yet, despite that being well researched, we know from Gallup, from example, that only 13%, and we don't know if it's 13, 20, but seems to be a low number of employees are really engaged at work. And so it might be due to some of the challenges you mentioned, which means it's not that easy to build engagement in the workplace. Mm, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are different definitions of how you measure engagement. So different survey providers have come up with a different number. But uh, we, we're not suffering from a problem of too much engagement. That's clearly the case. And I think the, and particularly in the current environment where people are talking about you know, the great resignation, uh, the difficulty of attracting and retaining talent, then the ability of managers to engage their people is terribly important. And it really is one of these questions of what can they do to address this? And that's why we came up with the model. This is very, very simple. You can carry those four different dimensions around in your head. And I think particularly with the whole move towards uh, leader coach, which is obviously something the AC is very interested in, It's what can leaders themselves do when they're coaching their employees to think about how to engage people. So it's really asking them about you know, how, how much do you feel you belong in the organization? What is it that might make you feel more at home? It's sort of questions like that. Or do you feel that you have enough say in things you know, or are there things which we could do to involve you more? You know, it's those kinds of questions which begin to sort of open up the door to explore right. what can be done to engage people much more. And that's where that kind of coaching style for managers, I think, can be really, really helpful. Oh, yes. And, and you mentioned the new world of work we are in now. And when I think of your model, I would think particularly the connection. So the first of your four pillars is becoming increasingly difficult to have, well, to give your employee that sense of connection, to build it digitally, Uh, it's not easy. It's harder than, than being face-to-face -face and having that personal interaction. Mm. It is potentially a barrier. I agree. I mean, I would say that you know, two years on from the start of the pandemic and that kind of big shift towards people using virtual working, I think a lot of people have learned stuff along the way. And, you know, and, and even, for instance, students are coming into the world of work. One of the big advantages they have is they've done all their studies online, so they're used to it as well. So I think the whole world has learned a lot about how, we, how to interact and how to create that sense of connection. And yes, it's not to say that it's uh, a substitute face-to-face -face contact. I think that's really important. But at the same time, you know, in many organizations, you're going to have some people who are potentially working remotely all the time, some who are working remotely some of the time. They're on sort of flexible working schedules. And if you're in a big country or working internationally, you may have people you just can't bring together because of reasons of distance. So having that capability of helping to sort of engage people remotely is going to become really, really important. And there's a few things which I think digital does help us with. I mean, one is, you know, it's a very flexible medium. So whereas often in a workplace, the you know, can get squeezed by meetings and people interrupting you and this kind of thing, you can nevertheless have the possibility with the technology to agree with people when to schedule those kind of check-ins or coaching calls at different times that suit everybody. So that's something where the kind of the flexibility of the medium can actually be quite useful. Uh, but the other thing too, which uh, I think is quite useful, is that when you have teams on a group call, for example, they can actually be quite a great leveler because when you have a, a group in a room together, it's easier for one or two people to dominate the conversation And when you have that kind of uh, Zoom effect where everybody's just one icon on the screen, then it is a bit easier for everybody to go and have their say. 
But clearly, it's important for a line manager to make sure they moderate those things effectively. Um, they do make sure that the the calls are about information sharing and not just about telling people. Uh, and it's also about making sure that when you have those sessions, you look after the personal side. It's not just about business. And there's been some great experiences people have had with you know, online coffee get-togethers and this kind of stuff just to sort of socialize so it's not just seen as being, well, I'm on screens, so it's business. So there are things you can do to kind of break the ice like that. And I think yeah. Too. They are, Jeff, and, and though at the same time, so on one hand, we can say, look, people are becoming better skilled, as you say. Eh? Leaders are learning to lead better remotely. Employees are learning to engage better remotely. At the same time, I have a question about the whole engagement model. I'm, I'm doing some research on post-pandemic leadership, and I was interviewing some CEOs to find out about what has changed for them. And one of them told me, look, my worry at some point is to end up managing a, a group of gig workers. Gig workers, mm -hmm. meaning in the gig economy, those people don't really belong to us. They are outside the company. And therefore, I have a very weak link with them. And he might be worried about it. I think most companies will end up with a larger part of their population becoming gig worker. And mm. then if you say engagement is a cost for the company, it's an investment you decide to make and to fill all those dimensions you mentioned around connection, support, voice, and scope, you need to invest in it. You could ask what is the right level of engagement with gig workers versus with a full-time real employee. So maybe it's an investment question that CEO will have to make. Yes, and I, and I would also reframe that a bit because at the end of the day, whether the people are on your payroll or not, what he's really saying is they're all on the team. So the question is, how do you make them feel like they're on the team? And that's very much about, again, creating this sense of connection. And do we all have a sense of shared purpose? Do they feel like they've got what they need as, as uh, third party workers to you know, do their role, to have the right information they need? Are they being treated with respect or do they get stuff dumped on them at the last minute? Do they have a say in what's going on? And are they sort of actually actively involved or do they just sort of get to hear at the last minute? And then also, to what extent do they sort of feel like this is a project when they're working on it, which is also something which can be fulfilling for them? So I don't think they're, they're actually mutually exclusive. On the contrary, I would say that you know, engaging people is applicable whether they're employed directly by you or the people who you're working with more broadly. And if you look at you know, the example I mentioned at the beginning with connection, uh, some fantastic examples of connection in voluntary organizations, I mean, people who belong to associations and things, uh, there's no money involved with that, but you get tremendous engagement because they have that shared sense of purpose. That's a really great point, Jeff. So in this sense, you are saying, look, the model apply, no matter if you're on my payroll or not. Maybe what I need to do might differ. Maybe the intensity might differ, but it still apply. That makes me think, is there a risk at some point if you have too much engagement? So is more engagement always better? Uh, well, you can always have too much of a good thing. And, uh, and, and the same applies to engagement. Uh, in fact, there is... Uh, one person, Christine Maslach, who actually would contend that uh, engagement and burnout are opposite ends of the same continuum. And that uh, you know, if you go too far, what you get is a situation where, you know, the engagement is driven so high that actually it leads to sort of unhealthy behaviors in an organization. And, and I think there's some truth in that, because if you look in organizations where there's you know, high pressure, which is taking place where people are being asked to do sort of the impossible with very limited resources, then the, the risk is that people do feel like it gets too much. It's a situation where you know, work-life balance gets a bit out of control. You end up sometimes with things like presenteeism, groupthink, stuff like that. And so what's happening is that the you're getting a shift from people being engaged to being pushed into an environment where they're being taken into a risk of burnout. And and the risk then when you get burnout is people become cynical, actually start to lose interest, um, but they don't necessarily appreciate what's going on at that point. And actually it can become quite toxic. So you always have to be careful. You know, is are people enthusiastic or are they cheerleading? Do they feel challenged or are they being overloaded? 
So it's about getting that balance right. And that's, again, something where managers play an important role. I saw research recently that shows the connection between level of consciousness of people and risk of burnout. And, and what they found out is when people started working remotely with a higher level of consciousness, which has always been important in any role, so your ability to self-organize, to deliver, to execute, has always been important to, to be successful. And yet when you work remotely, it's even more important because you have less the common context, the office that organize your day and, and lead you towards your objective. And yet they found that people with high level of consciousness have been more at the risk of burning out remotely because mm. they took even more on them. So I like your, your story mm. about engagement and, and burnout, which is a risk. Uh, and that is often the risk is that people who are perfectionists who are highly conscientious who really want to do the best job they're the ones who are more risk of burnout so that's where it comes back to that element of support it's about the you know the manager being checking in and being concerned about you know are people okay are they doing too much or are they at risk of burning themselves out in their role Thank you, Jeff. I love the model, the, the, the foundation of trust and fairness, as you say, which are preconditioned. And then you build the four pillars around connection, support, voice, and scope. That's really something you can give any leader and say, where do you stand? Where does your team stand? And, and give them some direction about what they can improve. So very, very clear and, and very helpful. To close today's uh, podcast, I have two questions for you, Jeff. We, we talk about you as a coach. So tell me a little bit, with all the experience you have as a coach, what would be one advice you would have for, for other coaches that maybe are starting in the profession? Uh, I would say it's about keeping learning. There is a danger sometimes that people go through their coaching training, they've completed their you know, certification, they think, okay, that's it, now I can go off and I'm, I'm good now, I can just keep working at it. To me, i found it's, it's an ongoing journey. There's always new things you can learn, there's always new things you can take on board. And that's actually one of the great things about what's offered by the AEC. You've got coaching perspectives, you've got lots of webinars, podcasts, other events, lots of things which bring you new, new perspectives, new ideas, new things to challenge you. And I, I think it's important just to continue to go and do that, not just because you're saying, yes, I want to do it for CPD purposes, but actually just to keep yourself fresh, to stretch yourself, to be open to new things and to sort of see what, what they can do to help you. And you know, for me, that's been one of the, the great things in my journey as a coach is just exploring and trying new things and discovering topics which I was less aware of, but which have been quite enriching. So I'd say it is it is important to keep that learning journey on the long term after you, after you start approaching and not just to sort of see it as being an event, but something which is continuous. So being certified is the start of your learning journey, not the end, ideally. And and to your point, Jeff, there are so many formats those days where you can keep learning. Could that be podcasts like we do today? Could that be articles, videos, classes, uh, exchange with colleagues, supervision, co-coaching? There are so many models that one can use to do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very last question, Jeff, a little bit about vision, a bit about the future. Where do you see the coaching practice or profession in five years? What, what's going to change? How will it evolve? Mm, well, I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, I mean, what I, what I do see, and I, I'm sure many of the people listening to this will, will see the same, is this whole big democratization of coaching. Now, coaching used to be one of these things which was very selective. It often applied only to people who are senior in organizations. Uh, and as a result, there were only sort of a few people who would actually benefit from coaching. Whereas now what you see is it's touching people much, much more. You know, you're seeing it spreading more widely through things like team coaching as opposed to just one-on-one -on -one coaching. You're seeing it being done through technology rather than just face-to-face. -face. And you're also seeing it through it happening not just to leaders in particular, but you're seeing it happening at all levels of the organization, those leaders themselves actually becoming leader coaches and helping their own people. So what's going to happen, I think, in the coming years is that more and more people will be touched by coaching and coaching is going to have an impact on them. And that's actually extremely positive and very exciting because it means that coaching can make much more difference to the world. And I think that's why we're all keen on the topic 
at the same time, though, I think it also raises some challenges for us as professionals in this area because the more people are exposed to coaching, the more discerning they're going to become and the more that will probably affect their expectations about what they get out of it. So that also means for all of us, again, we need to keep learning, continue to develop, and continue to think about how we can add value through our own coaching work. You remind me of my own coach, Jeff, who said, look, there are 8 billion people out there. Who have you not yet spoken with? And, and that's where I should be finding clients. So yes, uh, it's exciting and it's going to push us to get better and better, which is really great news. Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. It was nice speaking with you today. Thank you for being our first guest for the ACDAR podcast and for sharing all the experience and the research you've done. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Sylvain. Thanks for listening to another podcast by the Association for Coaching. I am Sylvan Newton. For 20 years, the AC purpose has been to inspire and champion coaching excellence, advance the coaching profession, and make a sustainable difference to individuals, organizations, and society worldwide. To find out more about the Association for Coaching and our member benefits, follow us on LinkedIn or explore our website at associationforcoaching.com. You can keep up to date with our latest podcast episodes, enjoy the wealth of digital learning offerings, and get insights from our Coaching Perspectives magazine.